Super. Thank you. Okay, so I, uh, I had the opportunity to present two initiatives that we, uh, we actually presented or uh, that grew out of our efforts in genomic medicine that you've heard about over the past uh, year or so. Um, these come from uh, the strategic plan implementation efforts that we've presented to you uh, in, in May and September, the disease-oriented genomic medicine working group that uh, Rick and Rex uh, have served on and, and Dave uh, Valley and George uh, uh, Jeff Ginsburg were on previously, and then the, the new genomic medicine working group that uh, Rex and Pearl are, are currently on. Um, this also arises from the Genomic Medicine Colloquium that we held in June in Chicago, uh, which showed over 20 active uh, genomic medicine centers at varying stages of implementation. And so we, we were really asking the question in June, is there anything going on out there, um, having heard of a few things? And, and we were surprised to hear how much there, there actually was going on. Uh, those were supported through multiple institutional, primarily institutional, in fact, uh, funds, very limited uh, NIH funding, uh, although some of them have built on the CTSAs and the Clinical Translational Science Awards, um, and also on the uh, Pharmacogenomics Research Network, particularly their new translational pharmacogenomics project. Uh, and what we heard was that there were numerous relatively similar efforts, a lot of shared needs, a lot of common barriers. Uh, just a, a, a brief glimpse of the kinds of programs that uh, we heard about, uh, Jeff Ginsburg's METRI at Duke, uh, the PGRN I've already mentioned, particularly their TPP. Um, uh, Cleveland Clinic has a genomic medicine program, so does Vanderbilt. Uh, this is part uh, at St. Jude, part of the, the PGRN again. Uh, Medical College of Wisconsin doing a sequencing program, as is the uh, undiagnosed disease program at NIH. Partners has a similar effort. Uh, the NCI has uh, an effort, so to, and uh, Howard's got the pg &E program at UNC Chapel Hill. So there's a lot that's, that's going on here. Um, relatively disconnected, and one of the uh, uh, arguments for having the meeting in June that, that Jeff Ginsburg made very um, cogently was there's a need to get these groups together um, and see where they can and sort of share uh, expertise and, and lessons learned. Uh, if you wanted to group some of the, the major efforts that are ongoing in this area, they would include screening for highly penetrant germline mutations, particularly in cancer, uh, integrating patient-reported family history into electronic medical records and providing clinical decision support based on that, uh, integrating uh, ph pharmacogenomic variants into decision support-enabled EMRs for, for drug selection, uh, genomic sequencing for diagnosis or individual treatment, but there are a number of other uh, efforts as well. Uh, and again, the so sources of support, I'm just showing a, a, shoot, a few, certainly not all of them, but uh, um, there's heavy institutional support at, at those four institutions uh, and, and the federal support I've already mentioned, including the, uh, also the CDC's GAPNet or Genomic Applications and Practice and Prevention Networks, the CTSAs, uh, PGRN and the NCI's program. Common barriers that we heard about uh, in June and, and have heard about since are at the level of, of both institutions and clinicians. Uh, some skepticism about whether this stuff really makes a difference. Uh, a lot of that may be fueled by um, perhaps some past promises and failures to deliver, as well as that relatively limited evidence to, to this point um, that this actually does make a difference. Uh, so there's some resistance uh, on the part of, of these groups. Uh, and there's also institutional inertia. This involves a, a fair amount of changing and, and re-engineering of uh, workflows, medical records, and other things, and, and that's a challenge. Um, there are some fairly high expectations for, for evidence, some expecting uh, evidence of, of impact on morbidity and mortality, uh, which it, it, for the large part is not there yet. Uh, needs for CLIA certification and, and IRB approval, um, and, and again, sort of treading that difference or that boundary, if there is one, uh, between clinical practice and, and research. Some confusion over consent and counseling models, uh, difficulty in integrating the results with existing EMR systems, and, and there's been some work to, to work with the major EMR vendors to try to address that. Uh, interestingly, a lot of these centers are doing that individually with each of the EMR vendors, which makes little sense. Um, the burden of interpreting and following up what are viewed as being potentially massive numbers of results. Uh, and, and I think if you can, at an institution, get them to relax a little bit and say, we're only talking about a few to begin with, you know, obviously that's the slippery slope, but it gets you somewhere. Uh, and, and some reluctance to be sort of the first to adopt a novel patient care strategy. So if we can make more obvious the, uh, the, the sites that are in the lead and are having some success uh, with this, we may uh, get sort of a follow the leader approach here. So what we're proposing then is demonstration projects um, in genomic medicine. We um, um, consider genomic medicine to be incorporating a patient's genomic findings into their clinical care, and we'd like to demonstrate the feasibility of that, hence the demonstration research, um, and assess it in sort of real world, world settings, hopefully in, in diverse areas. Um, goals would be to expand existing genomic medicine efforts and develop new projects and methods in diverse settings, uh, a variety of, of practice settings, as well as a variety of populations. 
um, contribute to the evidence base regarding the outcomes of implementing genomic medicine. So if we can get these, to, these efforts to be broad enough or large enough, can they actually uh, uh, provide us some, some evidence we can use in terms of, of assessing effectiveness? Defining and disseminating the processes of, of uh, genomic medicine implementation uh, and the diffusion and sustainability in diverse clinical settings. So the lessons learned from these sites will be enormously valuable, we expect, um, in, in uh, getting other sites to adopt this and, and evaluate it. So the proposed approach would be to link early adopter sites to some less experienced groups, expand the numbers and types of sites at which implementation is being done, uh, including health maintenance organizations and integrated health care systems, community hospitals, potentially private practices, even the military or veterans care. There is a military program in the Air Force, I think very uh, forward-looking uh, uh, view on the, on the part of the Surgeon General of the, of the Air Force, uh, underserved and indigent populations. And from this experience, really try to develop best practices for doing this so that each group doesn't have to reinvent the wheel every time they, they try to go out and, and begin this, and then collect evidence of the impact on outcomes, because many of these are unanswered questions or open questions in terms of their effectiveness. So what this might look like is we start with a lead site, like some of those that uh, we, we had in June or others uh, that could define themselves as such, uh, and then really link them up with other partner sites in various places, either nearby or distantly, um, that, that might have different capabilities uh, um, and be uh, diverse in terms of their practice settings. Uh, we could have a, a number of these. They could be of varying sizes. Presumably, each of these multi-center projects would be addressing a different clinical problem um, or genomic medicine implementation problem. Project, although that might not you know, be necessary, and again, that would be something that would be uh, in, in the details of a, of a solicitation. Uh, we would also have a coordinating center that would link these together and to do many of the things that Lucia was describing um, in terms of, of uh, uh, collecting and stimulating uh, group, sort of group processes and, and uh, identifying lessons learned, and also to find a way for the other consortia that are uh, working in this space to have sort of one point of contact rather than four or 16 or 20. Characteristics that we would encourage um, in the lead and the partner sites would, would include institutional endorsement, uh, involvement of practitioners, uh, um, and as well as uh, patients willing to participate, uh, and potentially an identified group of clinicians who are interested in learning about, receiving, and acting upon genotyping results. So, so there has to be sort of a ready audience. Um, we're, we're hoping that someday um, even those that are, are more reluctant that, we're, that may not be ready to do this would, uh, would join at some point. But right now we're starting with the sort of the the, you know, a cohort of the willing, as it were. Uh, there would need to be um, uh, capabilities for CLIA certified genotyping, uh, efficient workflow for assaying reporting results, a process for integrating the genotyping results into patients' medical records, and providing uh, appropriate clinical decision support, and alternative, potentially non computerized processes for settings without sophisticated EMRs, if there's a, uh, an approach for doing that. Also, uh, would definitely want sites to, to propose what outcomes they would want to assess. Uh, these could be as simple as either patient or clinician satisfaction or frustration in, in dealing with uh, these results, uh, but hopefully something even a, a little more advanced, such as uptake of the, of the recommended interventions, uh, impact on cost or, or resource utilization would be great if there could be some morbidity outcomes, but these are small projects and that may be uh, a, a desideratum at the, at the moment. Uh, we would expect approaches for collecting and assessing outcomes, uh, a plan for making this sustainable um, and possibly even expanding a successful implementation projects. Currently, the state of the art is, is that uh, to, to sustain these efforts, uh, they, they need to be uh, essentially reimbursed by third-party payers. And so understanding what it takes to be able to do that and, and driving toward that is one aspect of sustainability. There may be others. Uh, leveraging institutional support and other resources and identifying a clear path, as I mentioned, uh, towards sustainability. And the ability to contribute objective evidence that's most likely to influence uptake, to convince um, um, both payers and uh, institutions and patients that this is a useful thing um, uh, would also be uh, encouraged. The role of the coordinating center would be to collect and disseminate protocols, for example, for successful implementation in a variety of settings. So what works in the Air Force may not necessarily work in other uh, settings, and, and likewise, if one's doing this in a pediatric setting, it may not work in a, in a different kind of hospital or, or um, uh, practice. Uh, we would also hope that they would organize, the coordinating center in particular, would organize broader, um, more open meetings of the genomic medicine community, such as the, the three or four that, um, that Eric described to you in his director's report. Uh, we are hoping to continue this uh, because we do recognize there's a lot to be learned amongst these, uh, uh, from these centers from, uh, from each other, and, and we have a lot to learn from them as well. And the, the PGRN used this model very effectively, where they be, sort of began with a, a very open um, meeting that was largely informational. Forgive me if 
I'm, if I'm misspeaking. Um, initially, uh, say a first day, and then a second day would be the, uh, the PGRN investigators themselves who were really focused on how to make the, the work of their grants move forward. Um, coordinating with related uh, NHGRI and NIH projects, such as you heard about uh, previously, Return of Results, the CSER uh, Consortium, Emerge, PGRN. Obviously, NHGRI staff play some role in that, uh, we, we would hope, uh, but we would also hope that our coordinating centers and the consortia would be uh, um, uh, interested and eager to do that. Uh, and exploring the potential to expand projects potentially beyond the initial lead and partner sites. Maybe not to new partner sites because there may not be resources to do that, but there might not be a good reason that a, you know, a network that's focusing on, on family history couldn't then um, take on one of the pharmacogenetic implementation projects or, or take on a, a cancer medicine uh, implementation project. And we would encourage that, recognizing that, uh, that it might be challenging to do with the resources available. The hope really is to create a cadre of institutions that are evaluating and implementing genomic medicine protocols uh, and collecting and disseminating the successful approaches. Anticipated funding would be uh, $3 million in fiscal 13 and for about four and a half per year in fiscal 14 and 15. We've designed this as a three-year project. These things do take time and that may be a little bit optimistic and we welcome your, your advice on that. Um, we would propose to support three to five multi-center demonstration projects, each with one lead and maybe three to five partner sites, plus a small coordinating center using a UO1 cooperative agreement uh, mechanism. And as always, we would seek support from other NIH institutes. And uh, would very much like to thank uh, particularly those who were at the, uh, the December meeting of one of many December meetings that we held, uh, and the Genomic Medicine Working Group, particularly Rex, who chaired that uh, session. So uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. <coughs> Howard? So one of the things you just mentioned was the, the timeline for, for this work. And I think uh, the, the uh, projects that are going to be um, going to be earth shattering in, in terms of, of moving the field forward will we'll certainly take uh, four to five years or seven years or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some, some very um, process oriented type work that needs to be done mm -hmm. to, uh, I guess, let me step back. Right now, when I talk to uh, general practitioners and others that are in, in that area that don't know a thing about this, they they don't they don't think it can be done in their practice setting, mm -hmm. and so I think there's some work that is maybe only a one year horizon or a two year horizon that just shows that it can be done, mm -hmm. and and lays some of the foundation for the road that then we can drive on it you know whatever analogy you want to take. But mm -hmm. uh, so I I think a blend there if if all we do is come out with a bunch of four or five year projects, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we're in the field as much of a favor is if we have a, a bit of a tiered approach. Super. No, that's that's an excellent point. Thank you. We'll uh, we'll uh, try to aim for that. Other comments? Rex. Yeah, I, I was just curious about um, the focus on um, experienced versus sort of unexperienced sites. Uh, my sense of this uh, is that. There's no site that's experienced across the board. I mean, everybody's struggling with this. This is really hard to do. So um, I, I guess I would encourage you to think about blurring the focus between experienced and unexperienced, because I think everybody's pretty unexperienced in this. And even the most experienced sites can learn from uh, other uh, sites that might be involved. So I wouldn't focus too much. I would encourage you not just to focus too much on experience versus unexperienced, because I think you might get some more synergies if you had a few sort of medium experience sites uh, mm -hmm. involved in that as well. No, excellent, excellent point. Thank you. I, I think it is going to be challenging to figure out how, how do you get that balance where, where you've got folks who can actually do this kind of work, as well as, you know, we do want to spread this a little bit. So perhaps some kind of a mix, as you said, and, and, and you know, allowing the medium experience would be a, a good thing. Right. Yes, Russ. Uh, so at these uh, concept clearances, you can definitely see an, an emphasis on uh, uh, moving towards the, uh, the, the, the clinics. And, and, and this is getting a little outside my expertise, but I, I think it might be helpful to hear a little bit more about this. We just, I, I'd like a little more clarity about how this program is uh, different from some other programs that at least to people who are not so closely related sound kind of similar. So the the CSER, Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research, is uh, supposed to be, it, it is, we just, we just funded people to look at the uh, application of genomic sequence data to the care of patients. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. which sounds to me kind of like what this is. Sure. And I, so please uh, uh, clarify that. Yeah, no, it's, it, obviously they're, they're related and we want them to be related. It's important that they build on each other. The, the CSER program is, is focused entirely on sequencing. These, this would use other, other technologies. But more importantly, this is really sort of at the, the end where you're using this in a patient's clinical care. In, in ways that the, the CSER program may not be doing, and we don't know exactly what those would be. But I think because we would you know, entertain things outside of sequencing, and, including family history, pharmacogenomics, a whole variety of other stuff that is probably ready to begin at, at this point, I think it would add on to. And we may you know, decide that there's really nothing more that needs to be done in clinical sequencing in you know, in patients at, at this time, uh, because that is well covered. And I think that would be something we'd have to look at carefully. Does, does that help a little? Um, it it, it kind of helps some. Uh, I mean, it, you know, obviously there's the more technologies uh, are being brought to bear. I, um, uh, I guess, uh, and then uh, another question I had is your, your, your be, uh, uh, that the, the plan is to, to move these efforts, you know, to, to more uh, uh, institutions. But the fundamental question of efficacy is sort of being addressed towards the end of it. And, and, and uh, clearer data on uh, effectiveness would certainly promulgate without having to push. Well, and I just wondered about the. the uh, um, uh, uh, those priorities. Yeah, no, that's a good point, and I'd, I'd welcome Jim and, and Rex to comment in, in terms of, of the, the clear evidence pushing this to, to being accepted, because there, there are such institutional barriers to getting this sort of thing done that that's really what this program is designed to, to try to address, is how do you get the politics, and you know, frankly, it is a lot of it, um, politics, how do you convince the, your lab director that it's worth getting CLIA certified? Uh, you know, a lot of really ugly sausage making, basically, that goes on in, in doing this, and I think that's where the emphasis here would be. Um, Brad may want to make a comment about the CSER program, but before you do, Jim and, and Rex, Howard, you've done some implementation. Um, did you want to add or do you agree with? I, I can give, give some examples of the kinds of things that I think this program would help us get uh, better hands around. Um, you know, s- some of the barriers are the fact that physicians have a certain workflow, and if you do anything that interrupts with that workflow, like present them with an alert, it's, it's a problem. And so to try to find ways that we can actually give them useful information, um, maybe not in a pop-up, but through other mechanisms, these are the kinds of things I think that these implementation projects would help us learn about. I think, you know, just at, at our place, we find that decision support is extremely variable from division to division to department to clinic. And what, what, one of the things that we were just talking about at a, at a recent <coughs> meeting is what happens when you present a recommendation in one clinic and you know, the other clinic doesn't see that recommendation and says, why do these crazy people over in that other division recommend this? So I think there's a lot of issues like this that only projects such as this are going to start to surface. And I think you know, I, I, implicit in your question is why not wait a little longer until the evidence is there. I, I think, A, there's a lot of people that think the evidence is already there um, vis-a-vis all the places that are actually already doing this sort of on their own, these early adopters. Um, but the other problem, I think, is that it's, it's not the evidence in many cases. It's these other things like the workflow, like how integration into EHRs goes, just what the practice operations are. And I think these projects are ones that will inform us a great deal about that kind of uh, barrier and how to get over it. So, so I think you're right, and I think it's a good point. There, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of similarity. I, I think that that's okay as long as there's a, a, an absolutely maintained focus on the fact that, that real evidence needs to be generated um, and real evidence of or lack thereof of patient um, benefit be, be critical to these. So I, I'm not that concerned about redundancy. Um, I think that there are some, you know, there are some different aspects to these, these programs. 
Um, I think there's a lot to explore, and and you know something I've railed about. I I think that we we shouldn't um, be pushing this in. These should be framed as opportunities to investigate whether, right? Not just how, but whether. Um, these new technologies can actually benefit patients. So I think it's absolutely critical. I don't mind the redundancy. I think what, what has to be inherent to all these efforts is that there be outcome measures that are identified. Um, and, and whether in the end these things actually, actually help um, diagnosis, which is where most of the promise is right now, eventually therapy, et, et cetera. And, and this, this is not being, going from a four-lane highway to a six-lane highway. Um, this is trying to get a dirt road in place of the donkey path. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's really trying to at least get something on which a highway can be, or a road can be built, as opposed to um, just a little bit of expansion of something that's already you know, rolling, Yeah, that's, in my mind. Anyway. That, that's, that, that's Amy and then, and then Brett. Yeah, I just want to echo what Jim said, which is um, I think it's critical that all of these efforts, particularly this one, focuses on the whether it should be translated. Because there is a sense, I think, that we're pushing the translation um, from research into clinical care, potentially prematurely. And I mean, that's, that's a, a clinical decision. It's an ethical decision. It's a social decision. And doing it without sort of study, studying whether that should happen um, I think can can come across um, as being inappropriate. So I think that this is a good opportunity to study that um, that that exact question of, of is this appropriate and and how should it be done if it is appropriate. And, and if I can add one thing, I think that the the proliferation that we see of of offers for say whole genome and whole exome sequencing by laboratories actually points up the need for this kind of thing because we have to actually figure out whether it's it's worthwhile, right? We've seen too many times things um, being rolled out in medicine because they're faddish and because they sound so good and then in the end didn't really make any difference. These, you know, so, so in, I would not take to heart the accusation that, that these efforts are redundant um, with, with say, commercial offers out there and laboratories offering this stuff because they aren't studying what really needs to be studied, which is, can this help help patient care, right? So I think by maintaining a focus on that, you, you um, actually contribute something to the field. I mean, I completely agree with the last few speakers, and I think the, in terms of prematurely going out there, on one hand, we're doing all this stuff on return of research results for what the presumption is that it's helpful, and that's already ending up in medical charts. Um, and it may be in one clinic, not another. So I think in many ways the horse is out of the barn on a lot of this, and it's to try to, I think, look at it in a rational manner, maybe pull the horse back in a few places. Well, I was, uh, I was just gonna say, that the, the way I think of the clinical sequencing program, the CSER, is that that's the laboratory. That's, that's where the experimentation is gonna drive a lot of the innovation in these areas. And so just kind of repeating what everybody else has already said. I, I, you know, that's, we, we were careful to put in the title of that program, Exploratory, because we really think that's going to you know, drive some of that innovation. But key to that program, and I think what needs to be key to this program also, is, is that it's not just do it and figure out how to do it well. It's do it, figure out how to do it well, and then study whether that's actually effective. Responsible. And if you don't have that last piece of it, then it just seems like you're pushing something that there isn't evidence to support the push for. Or uh, Jill, then Rick. But, but to see if it's effective, there has to be some tie-in with the clinic. And while you don't want to push things into the clinic prematurely, you have to have some way of doing parallel studies, non-invasive, not, you know, because otherwise, how do you validate, <laughs> right? So, I mean, I think we also have to be careful about what we mean when we say stay out of the clinic, don't translate too early, because there has to be some way of working with groups who are involved in clinical trials and that sort of thing, because otherwise you're never gonna test the efficacy of these approaches. Excellent. You don't necessarily have to make the treatment decision based on what you're learning, but you have to, if you can do these things prospectively and then see what the outcome you would have predicted 
does or doesn't come to pass. I mean, I don't see how else you can validate these things. I mean, don't you have to do, do a case? Can I mean, uh, absolutely. I, uh, you'd, you'd have to do if you're going to do a prospective one. You have to have ones that you yeah, do this and absolutely. one that is that part of the program. I didn't hear that. Maybe it is. Well, I think because this is a concept. Rick, so, so, you know, oh, I see. We, we need Thank to be a, a little bit broad, um, and, and we would expect investigators to come in with their best ideas. I can tell you many of the groups that we heard from in June are doing exactly that, you know, where they're, they're essentially, you know, some, one group is getting it and one group isn't, they're comparing outcomes, but they've, they've got lim limited power to do it. So, so. one thing, you, I think you said this, Terry, it, it's going to differ from case to, or disease to disease and case to case. So Likely, these, yeah. Uh, rare Mendelian sequencing, you know, occasionally, and there have been a couple of, a few cases where you actually, people say and find something, life, yes. right? Yes. So, mm -hmm. so, and those are pretty compelling, and you, you, you know, you don't want to mm -hmm. wait on those, but it's not the way most things are going to work, and so I think, and, and the public, I mean, we, we run into this a lot, the public, I mean, we, people come in all the time, I'm sure it happens to the, cent the big centers even more, that they want to have their genome sequenced on their kids, or this, or that, because They've heard those stories, and 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 I'm it, they're compelling, and I and I feel for them because I mm -hmm. would too, but um, but you're talking about something mostly this, different here, and, and you're I right. think you're going to have to explain that. That's part of that that is explaining that, and then the other part mm -hmm. is um, I wanted to actually ask maybe from what Jim said, do the fact that many of the uh, uh, commercial operations that are offering this now with very poor, I mean. They're not looking at efficacy at all. Right. They want to sell as many as they can. And while I understand that, it, it, that may, um, you, that's going to probably cause some pushback on this, right? I mean, so for instance, part of this might be to figure out how to fix some of the problems that come up in, in those uh, situations. It, have you, is that something that's part of the concept, or do you, have you guys talked about it much? Pro or? Probably haven't, haven't addressed that particular issue. I, I think, you know, trying to, to solve American capitalism as applied to medicine may, may be a little more than we can I handle, mean, but, yeah, no, but not and, to be facetious. But don't, don't, yeah. No, but don't get me wrong. I don't think it's wrong for them to do it. I think it just, no. but most of the time that's, I mean, it depends on what they are. You know, the genotyping companies just, you know, basically wanted to do as much as possible, maybe with sequencing and, and, and uh, with really practicing medicine, it'll be a little different when people are, are, are doing sure. that. But well, and I see Gene is, is standing at the microphone, and I'm, I might note that, that probably the CSER projects are going to have a lot more to, to inform the, you know, what the, the commercial efforts are than, than this project might. But Gene, do you want to comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, relative to this whole discussion, I mean, I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do in this return of results consortium that's just getting underway which I think obviously is going to have to integrate very closely with what you're talking about as well as the, all the other initiatives that we already have going on. And we specifically within that consortium are including both projects to, to actually you know, examine this in the context of an active clinical setting because you can't really study this empirically without doing it to some extent. But at the same time, we we funded projects that are absolutely backing up and asking the, that very fundamental normative question about whether we've rushed ahead too far and whether there are particular problems with this sort of blurring sometimes of the distinction between research and clinical care. So I think, I mean, ideally that that will be the place where a lot of these sort of broader policy issues get discussed. Um, and, you know, and whether we'll be able to reach consensus on a lot of them is, is unclear, but at least that's where the discussion I think will be going on. But again, I think we're going to have to really coordinate closely with all of these initiatives um, as well as with the coordinating centers for these initiatives, because it's all of this is related. Dee Dee? Yeah, I was just curious if you discussed this with NCATS and if this is, seemed like it might be something that would be. It, it may well be. Um, they, they so far have not expressed an interest because they're more on the discovery side than the implementation side, but I think they're moving, Dee Dee, to. to uh, to the discovery side, uh, sorry, to the implementation side. So, so that's a, a, a good suggestion. We'll do that. And Didi, I would point out, and I, maybe it was even alluded to. I mean, the the uh, the biggest budgetary component of NCATS is the CTSA program, and the CTSA program, I think, is going to really sort of be challenged to look on at new opportunities and and really be looked at under a different light now in a new organization. And I think. Probably that part of NCATS has great potential to inter eventually interact with the kinds of things we're talking about here. Especially considering the budget uh, issues. Yep. Yep. Considering, sorry? The budget. The budget, yes. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, Great. Uh, and the CTSA program is very big, mm -hmm. and this is very small pilot. And we think could inform the kinds of things they might be doing three to five years from now. Is in a good way to leverage. Yeah. Some. Oh. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. All right. Any last comments? Otherwise, I'll bring us to closure on this. Okay. All in favor of the uh, concept? Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs>